ever find yourself, you know, kind of lost in thought about what makes you you? And, and I don't mean just like your favorite ice cream flavor or whether you prefer cats or dogs, but that deeper question of what it actually means to be human. It's a question actually that has fascinated philosophers, I mean, literally for centuries. Like, what is a human person? You know, when you really get down to it. Right. And today we're going to be diving into two major approaches to this question, this age old question. One that tries to sort of break down the ingredients of a person. You know, what are we made of? And another that explores what it actually feels like, the experience of being, well, alive. The what and the who of being human, you could say. Exactly. So let's start with those ingredients. The uh, I think it's called the metaphysical perspective. Yeah, that's the one. OK, cool. So imagine... Like, we're trying to write a recipe, but not for a cake or anything like that, a recipe for a human. Well, we know right off the bat that we'd need more than just flour and sugar. Yeah. I mean, it gets really complicated when we start to think about things like, well, the soul, right, the mind. And for some people, even a spirit, whatever that means. It's a bit like, you know, when you're baking and you're trying to figure out if you can substitute baking soda for baking powder. Are these things basically the same or do they each have their own you know, unique purpose. So what you're saying is, depending on which philosopher you ask, you get a totally different recipe for a human. Exactly. So let's start with, uh, well, why don't we consider three different perspectives, okay? Mm -hmm. Each one with its own unique take on these ingredients, right? So we'll begin with the unspirited body view. And basically those folks would argue that it's all biology, plain and simple. Nothing more, nothing less. So everything we are, everything we think and feel, all of it just boils down to physical processes. Huh. That's a pretty straightforward, I guess, approach. It seems that way, yeah. yeah. But it does bring up some interesting questions, right? Like, what about things like our thoughts, mm. our feelings, and even that kind of hard-to-define sense of self that we all seem to have? That's a really good point. The unspirited body folks, they'd say that all of that, Every bit of it is just a product of our really, really complex brains. I can definitely see how that might be a tough pill to swallow for some people. So then what's the alternative? Well, on the totally opposite end of the spectrum, we have the disembodied spirit camp. Ugh. So they're basically the opposite, right? They believe that the spirit is the true essence of a person, like the most important ingredient. Okay. And that the body is, you know, just a temporary thing, like a rental car or something. Ah, got it. And actually, a really good example of this is, well, think about Plato's concept of the world of ideas. So in this view, there's this perfect realm where spirits or souls, whatever you want to call them, they just kind of hang out. And when we're born, our souls, they enter into these physical bodies. But, and here's the catch, they completely forget everything they knew before. So let me see if I've got this right. In this view, death is kind of like returning that rental car, you know? Maybe a little worse for wear, maybe not. And then our spirit, it's free to go back to cruising around the world of ideas. Yeah, that's basically the gist of it. Wild. Yeah. And a really good example, we were talking about this view, is Rene Descartes. He's the one who said, I think, therefore I am. And he was totally convinced that the mind or the spirit, that was the true source of identity of free will. Mm. And the body... Well, he basically thought of it as just a machine being controlled by the mind. Mind over matter, huh? So in this yeah. view, our thoughts are really what shape who we are more than our physical forms. No. But there's got to be some kind of in-between, right? Oh, right. Like a middle ground. Yeah, there totally is. Yeah, tell me more about that. Okay, so that's where the embodied spirit perspective comes in. And it's basically the idea that both our physical side, you know, our bodies, and our spiritual side, they're both essential parts of who we are. Like, they're totally connected. So, like, two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. And the philosopher, well, one of the big ones anyway, who really pushed this view was Aristotle. He saw the body as, like, the matter. So the physical stuff, right? Okay, and the soul is. And he saw the soul as form, but, and this is important, he wasn't talking about form like a shape or anything like that. Yeah. He meant that the soul, it gives the body purpose like a reason for being, and it lets the body, you know, actually function. Okay, I think I get it. But can you give me an example? Like, how does this whole form thing actually work in the real world? Sure, yeah. Um, cause so think about a hammer. A hammer. Yeah, hammer. So the matter, that's the wood and the metal, right? The physical stuff. Right. But its form, its reason for existing, is to hammer things in, right? That's yeah. what it does. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So for Aristotle, the human soul, it's kind of like that, but obviously way more complex. Like... It lets us think. It lets us dream. Heck, it even lets us question, like we're doing now, the very nature of our existence. I mean, that's 
pretty wild when you think about it. It really is. So what you're saying is our soul, it's like this special something that gives our physical selves the ability to do all the stuff that makes us human. All the amazing stuff, I mean. Exactly. You got it. Wow. Hey, that's really cool. So was Aristotle the only one who was like really into this whole soul thing? Oh, not even close. So let's fast forward a few centuries, okay? Okay, fast forwarding. To Thomas Aquinas. And he actually agreed with a lot of what Aristotle was saying about the soul, but you know, he definitely added his own, you know, little twists and turns to it. Oh, a plot twist. I'm into it. What did Aquinas bring to the table? Well, he got really into these different types of souls. He kind of built on what Aristotle was doing. Okay. So he talked about this thing called the vegetative soul. And basically, the vegetative soul is all about, like, growth and reproduction. You know, the kind of stuff that plants do. Makes sense. Plants grow. Right. Exactly. Then there's the sensitive soul. And this one, well, think about animals, right? So the sensitive soul, it takes what the vegetative soul can do, and then it adds in senses, like being able to see, smell, hear, all that, and also movement. Got it. So plants are growing, animals are sensing and moving around. What about us humans? What kind of fancy soul did Aquinas say we have? Okay, so like Aristotle, Aquinas said that humans, we've got this thing called the rational soul. Yeah. And it's this, well, it's this unique ability that we have to reason and make choices, like really think things through and make decisions about our lives. Okay, so far that sounds pretty similar to what Aristotle was saying, right? Right. But here's where Aquinas makes a hard right turn. Oh, he argued that the rational soul, it doesn't just disappear when we die. He said it's immortal. Wait, hold on. So you're saying that when our bodies die, that rational soul, that core part of us, it just keeps going. That's exactly what he believed. Yeah. And it's important to remember that Aquinas, his views were really rooted in his faith. So he believed that after death, the rational soul, he could go to heaven or, you know, maybe hell or purgatory. And eventually he said it would be reunited with the body you know, during some kind of resurrection. Whoa. Okay, so that is definitely different from Aristotle. Talk about two very different takes on the afterlife, right? For sure. And, you know, what's really interesting is that up until now, we've been talking about these different parts of a human. Like, we've been trying to define what the soul is. But what if, instead of doing that, we took a step back and thought about what it's actually like to be human? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what's the experience of being alive actually like? And that's where the existential approach comes in. So instead of putting the soul under a microscope, are you saying that this approach is more about like how we live our lives, like the choices we make and all that? Exactly. It's almost like we've been, you know, looking at this map yeah. of the human experience, right? Trying to like trace the outlines of the soul and all the different ways people have tried to, you know, define it. Yeah. And I like that analogy. And now it's like we're putting the map down. Putting the map away. Exactly. We're putting the map away. We're done with it. We're setting off on the journey itself. Right. And I think that's actually a really great way to think about the existential perspective. Right. Because it's not like those other approaches that try to give you a nice, neat answer. It's more about saying, hey, you know, go figure it out for yourself. You're writing your own definition. Exactly. You're the author of your own story, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Yeah. Because you get to choose. Like you decide what your values are going to be, what you're passionate about. What kind of impact you want to have on the world around you? That's, I mean, it's exciting, right? But also kind of, I don't know, a little bit daunting maybe. Like to have that much freedom to be that responsible for shaping who you are. Oh, for sure. It's a lifelong journey, no doubt about that. But you know what? I think it's a journey that's, well, it's worth taking, you know? Think about it like this. Every single day, you're faced with all these different choices. Right. Big ones, small ones, doesn't really matter. They add up. Exactly. And each one, each choice, it's a chance to like decide, am I going to live in a way that lines up with what I say I care about? You know, to get a little bit closer to like the true me. So it's less about trying to be some perfect version of, quote, human, whatever that even means, and more about just, you know, growing and learning as you go. Exactly. And you know what else? It's about being okay with not knowing everything. Yeah, that's tough sometimes. It is. It is. But it's also kind of exciting, right? Because there's always more to learn, more to experience. Mm -hmm. It's like you just got to trust yourself to figure things out as you go. That's a great way to put it. Wow, we have covered a lot of ground in this deep dive. <laughs> I feel like my brain is like full 
from those, you know, metaphysical building blocks of the human person to like the existential approach and all that freedom and responsibility and all that. It's a lot. It really makes you think. And that's what's so amazing about philosophy in general, right? Yeah, yeah. It pushes us to ask these big, huge questions that I don't know about you, but I don't think about every single day, you know? Yeah, it kind of shakes things up. It does. And, you know, it forces us to like, really look at what we believe about ourselves and the world around us. And why we believe those things, which I think is really important. It is. So to our listener out there, as you continue on your own journey, remember that this question, this question of what is a human person, it's not something with just one right answer. It's an invitation to go out and explore, you know, to never stop asking those big questions and to create your own unique answer through the choices you make every single day.